Well, I, I believe in free speech, but this is ridiculous. <laughs> well, I won't use that one of you so many times, you know. Of all the introductions I've ever had, that was the most recent. <laughs> and the other one, it's always good, Jim, when you get to messing with the machinery, just say that there's a screw loose in the speaker. <laughs> they, they know what you're talking about. Well, it's a great treat. I'm known Jim Consulman, uh, your president and CEO. Can you hear me there? <laughs> Through that voice. It's not, I don't get my pipes tuned at this hour in the morning. <laughs> but uh, thanks to Mike, uh, my chief of staff, he loyal, wonderful. And he'd come in and he'd say, Al, you're not going to do this, are you? And I'd say, yeah, I am. <laughs> but, but you can't. I said, who the hell cares? You know? <laughs> he said, I care. We all care. Anyway, but let me tell you something. Uh, he worked with Sheila Burke. My office was hidden right across the, the, the alleyway from Bob Dole so that when we'd get cracking, the media didn't know that we were huddling. I know you're all here. I've never, been, I've never seen anything in my life off the record, so don't worry, <laughs> even if you're one-on-one. -on -one. So anyway, uh, Sheila and Mike would put stuff together. Dole would send me off to do my work for 10 years. I served as his assistant, a magnificent man. I call him occasionally. He's so curious. What's going on, Al? Tell me what's up. And I feed it in. But when I walked in here this morning, some wag, I don't know which one it was, I asked a question. It actually took me quite aback. I was uh, quite flummoxed, and I want to answer the question right now. The answer to his question is, yes, I did sleep in this suit. <laughs> I hope that takes care of that question. I do iron and do my stuff on the road. Anyway, uh, as, I, as I said, I was here when we talked to each other. I was here when Mitchell talked to Dole and Dashiell talked to Dole and I talked to Cranston, he was the assistant leader. I talked to Wendell Ford, he was the assistant leader. We had great personal relationships, called each other names, had fun, never fooled each other, never tried to trick each other, and it worked. And uh, it's just it's very sad when the commission got together it took us three months to establish trust. I never heard more crap in my life as to the R's sticking it to the D's and the D's sticking it to the R's. I think the first three months was, uh, who's the biggest spending president in the United States for this guy? Answer, George W. Bush. Never vetoed a single spending bill in six and a half years. Not one. Until it came to stem cell research, which really wasn't a spending bill, as I could see it. And then the, the Republicans say, but this guy's outdone him four to one. And then the fight would start, slapping each other around. Finally, Erskine and I said, you know, we're just going to do a two-man report, just the two of us, instead of the 18. Well, they said, you wouldn't do that. And we said, the hell we wouldn't, because we're not going to do mush. Everybody does mush in this town. That's how you get along, mush with a blend of emotion, fear, guilt, and racism. You mix mush with emotion, fear, guilt, and, rac and racism, and you can get anything killed or passed. Kind of a goofy place to work. Anyway, it's good to be here with the Ripon. Lynn Martin, dear gal, I haven't seen her in a time, and Amo Houghton. I even wrote an article or two for the, for the paper, and then, of course, Wild Willie Frenzel, Dragged me into a lot of things. <laughs> One of them is this afternoon. Thanks again, Bill, for that. That's another free speech. That'll do it. <laughs> That'll do it anyway, you're a very vital group. I always feel a sense of balance and common sense when I'm with Ripon. Doesn't matter how left or right, because I'll tell you, in my party, we give each other the saliva test of purity and then we lose, and then we just bitch for four years. <laughs> Most amazing party. Well, I don't think this guy's conservative or another. Oh, he's a pinko. Oh, yeah, well, that's good. Well, then we will elect the guy who's against you 100% of the time until, instead of taking the guy who's with you 75% of the time. That's got to be pretty stupid.
Well, and then social issues, we won't even <coughs> discuss those here this morning. You can come up to me afterwards. I have some clear views on that. <laughs> and uh, I had a, a request. I had a request for the quick Wyoming story. Here it is. Is a couple hit the sack. Three in the morning, the phone rings. Guy answers, says, how the hell do I know? That's 2,000 miles from here. Hangs up. His wife said, who was it? He said, I don't know. He said, something not called mass if the coast was clear. <laughs> no. Anyway, it's good to be off the witness protection program. <laughs> we make sporadic sorties into various communities, so getting out of that. But let's get to the chase. My old pal Joe Biden called me in January of 2010. He said, Al, I got a real deal for you. <laughs> what is it, Joe? He said, co-chair of the commission. I said, well, let me get Ann in here so she can laugh, too. <laughs> and, uh, no, no, he said, listen. And then he spoke, and he was dead serious. He said, you, you, you had something moving in the Congress, and seven of your party voted against it who were co-sponsors. That's the way it worked. How the hell can you get along doing What was the reason for that? I thought first it was to slap it to Obama. I think now that it wasn't, I think they feared a lot of things that, uh, they feared a bat tax. Somebody spread that little bit of venom and that'll get you a long way. I think they're gonna have a bat tax. Oh God almighty. On top of the income tax, of course, that was never described that you get rid of one to get the other, but leave that out like you do in this jolly village. So Joe said, do this. I said, who would be the co-chair? He said, Erskine Bowles. And uh, there is a real, that was the lure for me. I knew who he was because Dole and Elizabeth had told me about what an amazing man he was when she ran against him and beat him for the Senate. He is a prince of a man, uh, a rare treat. Uh, I trust and admire him uh, and more than you know. And he's the numbers guy and I do the color. <laughs> and occasionally people will ask, you know, the, sharp, the sharpshooters are out there. Now, uh, why did you do the GDP over the gross DB, you know, you know? And, and if you torture statistics long enough, eventually they'll confess. <laughs> so I say, I say, you know, I had a mortar platoon in the army and I, we didn't have earplugs. I didn't hear your question, but I think Erskine, you heard that. <laughs> <laughs> Erskine steps into the breach, and I nod. I said, I, I could have answered that if I had heard it. <laughs> so they say, why are you doing this? And we say, we have 15 reasons. He has nine grandchildren, I have six. We thought at first we were doing it for our grandchildren. Then we figured out we were doing it for our children. Then we figured we were doing it for us, because that's how close the, the, the train is. To, to the edge of the, of the track. So anyway, um, and we were, we were called uh, stocking horses for new taxes. That was a brilliant phrase from the person I'll mention by name momentarily. I said, we're stocking horses for our grandchildren. That's what we do. So I said, we're not doing anything until we see the president. We said, everything has to be on the table, including your new health care plan. He said, that's, that's good. And he said, fine, and he, he's kept that. So we launched, 18 of us. As I say, we had all those months to establish trust. Told him it would be a two-person caper. But the, the stronger we made the package, the more support we picked up. And then when we got Durbin, that was an, you, you need to credit. He, I know he's a Democrat, and I know you're supposed to barf or throw something now, but don't. <laughs> Just don't do that. He's a hero. Because he couldn't have done that uh, if Harry had told him not to. And Harry did, I think, tell him not to. And he said, well, the only thing worse than voting for it would be voting against it. And the day he voted, he said his son called and said, thanks, Pop. And that's where this baby is. So give him a lot of credit. And then, of course, we went through this. Is Andy Stern on their commission? Well, he's a commie, and he, he, Andy, he's a, yeah, well, he, no, he's a good egg. Tom Colburn, is he on your commission? Well, for God's sake. Those two guys worked in a union that was just absolutely splendid to watch. 
put together our package on the defense cuts. There were plenty of fat in the defense. Don't worry about the defense of your country. Here's one. The camera's rolling. I'll get my butt torn to shreds. There are 2.2 million military retirees. I was in the military, two years active duty in Germany, I don't know, eight years in the reserve. A few more years in the reserve, I would be a military retiree. Many have never been in combat. They have put 20 years of their life, but it might have been the National Guard, it might have been the reserves, it might have been whatever. And they're wonderful people, and they disrupted their lives, and they did. And, and they are people to be praised. They have a health care plan called TRICARE. It's separate from the VA, separate from anything. And it, it takes care of the dependents and everybody, and the premium is 470 bucks a year. 470 bucks a year and no copay, and it costs 53 billion a year. This country is shot through with stuff like that. And there isn't anybody in this wonderful town that won't protect it for that or whatever till they drop dead. And they're out there now. Man, I'll tell you, you ain't seen nothing yet as it gets closer and closer to August 2nd, which is drop dead day when all the pirate treasure has been exposed and there ain't nothing left and you vote on the debt limit. Well, anyway. At least five Democrats and five Republicans and one independent voted for this package. That's 60 percent. That'll get you anywhere in the Senate, 60 percent. So it was good to see that. A lot of people laughed when we started. They ain't laughing now. So read the report. God, this is a piece of crap. <laughs> uh, uh, re read the report, uh, www.fiscalcommission.gov. It's 67 pages. That's why you write this down, because you wouldn't write it down if you knew it was 500 pages of stuff that nobody will ever pay attention to. It's in English. It, it's, it uses phrases like going broke and shared sacrifice, words never heard. Uh, and it says, if you want something, pay for it. And so there it is. It's out there. It won't go away. It's like a stink bomb in a garden party. Uh, Erste and I already feel a tremendous surge of success with our work for we have effectively pissed off everyone in America. <laughs> this gives a person a great sense of power. Uh, I think, but there are still a few pockets, however, but we'll get to them before, before it's done. But back to those issues of stuff that you can't do anything with. We went to Gates and said, how does this TRICARE get to where people shouldn't, shouldn't they be paying four grand a year maybe or 400 a month or something for their insurance? He said, I've tried it 15 years and get my head blasted to bits by the VFW and I'm a life member, American Legion, retired military officers, gone. You can't get it done. You cannot get that done. Well, anyway, we just decided to take the heat and keep hammering. Pray for my pal Joe Biden and the gang of six, now five, because uh, I'll tell you, if they can't get it done, it won't get done. And whatever they come up with, the president will buy because Joe will address him and say, I've been through the fires on this one. And here it is. Here's the package. And the others will go back to Congress and say, we've been through the fires, and you have to listen to this. And as I say, if, if they can't get it in and get it done, it won't get done. You can't get this done without dealing with Medicare, Medicaid, the solvency of Social Security, and defense. And if somebody gets up still, and they do, well, they're going to get rid of waste, fraud, and abuse, all earmarks, and Nancy Pelosi's aircraft, uh, Air Force One, all congressional pay, you know, forget it. Just make a horse laugh right then and just know that we can't get out of the hole. That's about 6% of the hole we're in. So you have to go for the chunk. But let me tell you, when Erskine and I go around the country, give us 50 minutes with people from the right or the left and we'll get a standing ovation. 
not for our egos, that's out of it. But here's what you do. You don't use graphs. We don't have PowerPoint and all that crap. You just say, if you, if you spend more than you earn, you lose your butt. And if you spend a buck and borrow 41 cents of it, which is happening today, it was 40 cents a few weeks ago, it's 41 cents. If you spend a buck and borrow 41 cents, you've got to be stupid. Therefore, you have a Congress that is stupid and an administration that is stupid. These are harsh words. But the American people don't care about any of it anyway. They think they're all jerks, Republicans and Democrats. How, how goofy is it to borrow 41 cents if you were at your kitchen table and talking like that, and, and then people say, well, the deficit doesn't mean anything, or the debt. Well, the drinks are on me. If that was your home, you wouldn't be in a home. Then you'd laugh a lot about it. I thought the debt didn't mean anything, and they came and took the joint. Well, that's a strange thing. Anyway, I'm almost through here. Uh, we're going to get some questions. Uh, it, is, it is hard to believe that this place that I loved for 18 years and got a lot done is, is dysfunctional, totally dysfunctional. And it's all in the report as to what we, we did. I won't go into it. We talked about tax reform and three rates. People have been howling, broaden the base, lower the rates, get spending out of the code. Well, brothers and sisters, that's exactly what we recommended. Tax expenditures are one trillion 100 billion bucks a year, which if we got rid of them all and took 100 billion to reduce the debt and then took the other trillion and reduced the rates to 8% from 0 to 70,000, 14% from 70 to 210, and 23, if everything over that, and lower the corporate tax to 26 from 36. People have been talking like that, but that probably won't get done. Pretty hairy there. A lot of people on the other side. We couldn't even wrap our arms around Medicare. It is absolutely monolithic on automatic pilot. You can't, we at least tried to take a chop 400 billion out of it. Almost impossible. And, and you don't have to look at statistics, just know somebody in your family or some guy down the street who, you know, regardless of his net worth or income, had his heart removed or put back or whatever. And, Probably the operation cost 250000 bucks, and he doesn't know what it cost. So what the hell does he care? And then if he does find out, his co-pay would be about 1800 bucks. Now, that is unsustainable, totally. Medicaid, unsustainable. So, Social Security, just quickly. We are not balancing the budget of America on the backs of poor old seniors with violin music from the AARP accompanying that theme. Poor old seniors, what dribble. Uh, read of our generous plan, we'll go into it, but if you can't raise the retirement age to 68 by the year 2050, you, you don't know what the hell you're doing in your family anyway. And so that's what we suggest, which has been shot through, how can they do this well, the life expectancy is 78.1, and that Social Security was never a retirement. It was an income supplement. had nothing to do with retirement. had nothing built into it to take care of disability insurance, which will go broke in seven years. These are the trustees reporting. And what's really irony is that in this last year, by doing nothing, the drop-dead date was 2037 and you would get 22% less. In one year, they've moved the date to 2036, and you get 23% less. Now, that's in a year. If you can't figure that out, somebody's stupid. So, the real question is, where's the tipping point? Everybody asks that. Where the hell is the tipping point here? I think it will be very within the next 18 months. Erskine says a little longer. Some say six months. But I tell you when it will come. It will come when the rating agencies find out we have no plan whatsoever. None. Now, why aren't they hitting Great Britain and France and Germany? Because they have a plan. It may be totally unsavory, may be controversial, but at least it's a plan. We have no plan. So by doing nothing, or just pap, 
you know, extend the debt limit and, and nothing and get a few odds and ends and spending cut. We do nothing. The guys that hold our paper will say, huh, I want some money for my paper. And the paper is held half by private people, private investors, and half by foreigners, and half of that is China. And they'll say, I want some money. Now, if you extend the debt limit and get that done, and I think they will uh, in some scenario, don't ask me how, then the people that hold the paper and have loaned us money will say, the way you anguished over that, we'll still loan you money, but we want more interest. And that's the beginning of something you don't want to watch. And guess who gets hurt the most? The little guy that everybody always talks about in this town. Got to take care of the little guy. Well, you're going to take care of the little guy, guard him from inflation and a runaway government that can't do anything and provide services because we have no taxes to provide the services. So finally, we need a plan. And it doesn't have to be big, and we don't even have to start on it but we got to have one. So the real caveat is beware the AARP and Grover Norquist. Don't laugh. This is dead serious. How did they get this much power to make a Congress cower? This is really absurd. This is one guy with a happy band of warriors that pay him a lot of bucks, I guess, and he must pick up a lot of bucks. How did he get this kind of power? When he testified before us, he said, my hero is Ronald Reagan. I said, well, that's a wonder. I said, so he was mine. Well, he's, he's just the best of the best. I said, well, he raised taxes 11 times in his eight years. And Grover said, I know, I didn't like that at all. <laughs> I said, I don't give a damn if you liked it. He did it. Why do you suppose he did it? I don't know. I'm very disappointed. I said, he did it to make the country run. And here we are, never had, never had a war without a tax to support it, including the revolution. And now we have two and a quarter wars, I include Libya as a quarter, and no tax to support them. And this is what's got people steamed. What the hell is this? How can you do this? So anyway, Grover and Reagan, uh, when I told him he did it to make the country work, he kind of blinked like a frog in a hailstorm, looked around, didn't say much. Uh, <laughs> Why the hell would anyone sign anything if you're running for Congress? Why would a person sign anything when you're not even dealing with reality yet? I would never do that. Until you get to hard facts and reality, never never sign anything and then be held in thrall. Now, it was Lincoln that used the word in thrall. I think it was the second, can't remember which address. Look it up. It means a form of bondage over the mind. And if we are in thrall to Grover and the AARP, I can tell you as clearly as anything, we haven't got a chance, not a chance of getting something done, period. Scribble it down. So uh, I asked the AARP, uh, Ursula and I, they said, we'll help you when you get toward the end. We have a couple of modest suggestions. We said, well, could you tell us? Well, and John Rother, he's a cool cat, John smiles, kind of like a sphinx. I said, John, I've been watching you for 31 years. You just smile and you never do anything. And now Barry Rand is here. And I said, Barry, I respect you. Have you fallen in thrall to these guys? I said, are there any patriots in this leadership here or, or all marketers? And they're marketers. That's what they do. They're good at it. So there it is. But give them credit. Don't knock old Grover too much, because I'll tell you, they're wily, they're tough, they're, they're, they're absolutely spooky in their passion, and they are arrogant, and they're going to carry the day if the American people think that, uh, that we can get there by some reason. But if they carry the day, give them a badge of courage, and... Uh, and know that the credit they receive now will make them the laughing stock of America in a few years. I can promise you that because they say, who the hell did this? Everybody knew what this is. This is 14 trillion, 300 billion debt and 1 trillion, 700 billion deficit. 
And uh, somebody said, what's a trillion? I said, damn if I know. But if you, if you spend a million a day since the birth of Christ, you wouldn't be at a trillion yet. And you can get other figures that I don't grasp at all, but that's where we are. So let's see what happens to their country. I hope it's their country. I hope they're patriotic. Go back to Lincoln and remember what he said about the words enthrall, because that's where this country is, and it's not a very positive statement. And then I have one disclaimer. I did make a statement months ago, something about milk cows. But it was not fully reported, as often happens, so I want to clarify it. I had so many people come to my office and say, Al, God bless you, boy. I was a boy then. And uh, people say, why are you doing this? What they mean is at this age. What, that's what they mean when they ask that question. So people would come, and they're wonderful. They bring their, your roomie, your old football pal at the UW, somebody in your marriage. They'd always be with them when they made the call. The call is important to make with somebody you haven't seen for a long time. So they can put the heat on you. And they would just give me all sorts of praise, and then they would ask for theirs. It was usually raid the Congress day. You know how those work. You gather together in the city, and you have these marvelous meetings. You say, go forth for God's sake and get the scratch. And you do. You move out, and you visit all these wonderful people and put the heat on them. It's a glorious thing to watch. Go get the scratch, and there's cheers. It's like an athletic event. So, uh, and then they'd ask for their money. I finally lost my marbles. I turned to the window and you only go, <laughs> and pretend that I hadn't heard. But so I took a can of bag bomb and put it on my desk, a little green can with blossoms. They said, what is that? I said, it's an emollient, a salve, if you will. Salve, well, that's interesting. What does it do? I said, you apply it to the extremities of the bovine members of the quadrupeds that issue a lacteal extract. <laughs> Well, what does that mean, you smart ass? I said, look, the sun shines on the snow, bounces off the snow on the udder of the cow, chaps it, rash, calf comes to nurse, the cow kicks the calf in the head, hurts, you know. Then you put dollops of bag balm on there, just all you can. It's good for your hands. You put it on your feet at night. It's terrific. It stinks, though. It really stinks. But it's terrific. And they said, but why is it on your desk? I said, uh-huh. <laughs> if America has become a milk cow with 310 million tits, we need all the bag bomb. <laughs> well, there, enough of that. Ask any questions you wish. <laughs> yeah, oh, not you. <laughs> okay. So I'm sure you've talked to the vice president about the work that they're doing mm -hmm. with, his, with his group. So are you going to leave us with any optimism about, uh, about what they might accomplish? Let me tell you what's going on. You all know about networking. That's how you get here and how you make your money. Our executive director, Bruce Reed, is Joe Biden's chief of staff. There isn't anybody better. Wonderful man. Jack Lou is a great friend of Erskine's. They were together with the great budget caper. And don't forget, Erskine's the last guy to be involved in the balanced budget under Clinton in 96. You got Bill Daly, who knows how to make the trains run. Pretty vet, you know, pretty active, pretty vivid Democrat. You got Gene Sperling, very thoughtful guy. You've got uh, you've got Joe Biden. You got Henny Steny Hoyer over in the House. There's a really a wonderful guy to work with. But you see, in this atmosphere, if you mention that you like working with Steny Hoyer or Joe Biden or someone, they say, "Ah, oh, really? No kidding." I mean, see, that's the poison. Or you like Ryan. Oh, you do. That's the poison. Give Ryan credit, he threw a plan in. Give the president credit, he threw a plan in. Give Jan Schakowsky credit, she threw a plan in. I don't like those, but you got to have the guts instead of just sitting on the edge and bitching, whining, moaning. Oh, no, what are we going to do? Get in the game. And so I honestly can tell you that if uh, if the cards aren't right this time with those gutsy guys who are still in that room, and I think Coburn will come right back in as soon as... He just got tired of the crap, which was very simple crap. We're here to tell you we will not raise taxes a single penny. Take that. 
versus people, if you do anything to hurt the poor or the vulnerable or mess with our Medicaid and Medicare, we'll nail you. So there you are. We'll see what happens. But I really believe, I know Joe so well. He uses his humor. Uh, he's got, he's dealing with candor, pretty strong guy. These, these are, none of these guys are, are Wanda Wallflowers, I'll tell you. They're all strong, tough people. So I think something will happen, I really do. And if it doesn't, we won't be, uh, we won't disappear as a country. Our credit rating, or, uh, rating will be impaired. And we'll go on and inflation will start to kick in. And then we'll watch the wizards digging out of the, the, the rubbish. So, uh, but I, 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 I'm heartened because of those guys who I know so well, Durbin, Crapo, Chambliss, Warner, uh, Coburn, are all wonderful, wonderful, uh, wonderful people. Conrad, he'd been talking like this for 20 years. And finally they're hearing, and, uh, and old Kent, if they don't do anything, you'll see a Senate budget come out that'll have teeth, real teeth, so don't despair if nothing works, because I wouldn't have done this if I weren't an optimist. I really wouldn't. Wouldn't have any part of it. Because I'll tell you, the American people know exactly what's up. And they are sick and tired of it. I don't know where they'll go, but, uh, you know, is, there's a lot of things that are bad going on in the country. People aren't eating. It isn't about their unemployment check didn't go. They can't make it. And uh, they all they know is that somebody should be helping, not on the dole. I'm not talking about those. There are those. But uh, it's uh, the moment of truth is what we called our program, and that's what it is. And, uh, and they can keep chewing on it, but it won't go away because we hit everything, every single thing. And when I get interviewed by these beautifully coiffed uh, people on television, you know, men and women, you know. <laughs> and then, well, I don't think it's going to work, is it, Senator? It won't work, will it? And I said, well, it won't bother me. You just tap on my box. <laughs> but, but I tell you, pal, you'll be picking great with the chickens if it doesn't work. Well, I don't care. I know there's going to be nothing in Social Security. I said, great. Then when you step up to the window to get your check, which is probably 30% less, and you put in 6.2% of your salary, you're going to be pissed off. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think so. I said, well, that's because you're eating right now. So anyway, it's fun to just keep pissing people off. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it puts a lilt in your step at the age of 80, a <laughs> twinkle in your eye. My wife said, you're energized. I said, I've been, this is my goal. A goal of life to irritate people with every <laughs> possible juncture. Oh, somebody should ask her another question. Yes, sir. Ah, how are you? Nice to see Good you. Good to see you. Um, having been involved in Republican politics for 40 years, I wonder if you, I don't see a way in which the leadership of the Republican Party can support a deal that raises taxes, that increases <coughs> in any major way. So my question to you is, do you see a scenario um, where <coughs> Boehner and Mitt McConnell actually would go along with the tax increase? And if the Republicans actually do rule a tax increase off the table, is there a solution to this problem um, that could be achieved without a, tax, a major tax increase? Sure, you get rid of the damn tax entitlements. Those are expensive. Those are spending by any other name. Grover has the twisted view that if you get rid of a tax expenditure, that's a tax increase. Well, not in my book. And you, they're going to go for that. Somebody is really going to go for that. Now, they, they'll wait till, the, wait till the realtors. I sleep with the realtor. This is difficult business. <laughs> uh, 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 and the only one, too. And, uh, and, and they're going to come out of the woodwork. But we said about them, we said not a million bucks on in interest deduction, 500 grand, and then do a 12.5% non-refundable tax credit. That takes care of the little guy everybody always talks about. Do that with charitable contribution. So 
if, if the Republican Party is stupid enough to, to fall for the bait that reduction or elimination of tax expenditures is a tax increase, then this is a dull-witted party. Now, I hear that because these things are on the books because of some of the cleverest cats that ever wandered in this town, and we found that those tax expenditures are used by only 10% of the American people. Little guy had never heard of them. Oil depletion allowance, tight gas. I mean, you, you're talking about me. I mean, I'm biting my own head off. Mine's land reclamation money, parking for employees, Blue Cross Blue Shield. How the hell they got in there under the tax expenditures? There are 180 of them, and they're used by the wealthiest people in America. That's wrong. I'm not a Democrat. Uh, Buffett was right. He said, I pay less income taxes than my secretary. We found the top 400 richest people in America pay an average of 16% income tax. Now, no, the people aren't going aren't gonna to take that. I don't know what they're going to do, but they're not going to sit and watch that happen because the rich, poor class warfare is really out in the land. They hated me. Uh, look, I was in Congress. We, we should take your pension. I said, well, hell, I put in 8% of my salary. I ought to get that back. No, you shouldn't. You're independent, and I'm okay. They're going to have... How do, you, how do you straighten out Medicare? I'll tell you how you do it. You reduce the payment to providers and doctors. That's what you do. And you make affluent people pay more, and all people in it will pay more co-pay, and affluence tests the rest, and let hospitals keep one set of books instead of two or three, and quit the gimmickry between the states on Medicaid, how uh, they play the ping pong to get more out of the federal government from both sides. If you come in less, you get more from the feds. How's that for a solution? It's beauty, easy to do. We couldn't even do the dock fix. Do what they were supposed to. And they never will in reducing those fees. They'll never do the dock. They'll, they'll You're do with the, the American dock. Medical Association. Come to see you again. Anyway, where the hell were we? Oh, yes. Yes. Try to be shorter. Uh, one of the signal accomplishments you had was Simpson Mazzoli, which is the Immigration Reform Act. And unfortunately, a whole series of presidents and Congresses not, did not implement it. And now we're still in a in worse situation in terms of immigration. What do you say now about immigration, especially as it relates to the deficit problem? Well, I don't know. We didn't spend any time on that. In, in the commission, but I'll tell you, the bill we did, which was either called Simpson Mazzoli, a dear pal, and Rodino, dear pal, uh, never could work because as we got going, the right and the left figured out a beautiful phrase that if we went ahead with the identifier in there, it was a national ID. And Grover Babe passed out little little water-soluble things to put on your wrist, soak it in water. It was a barcode. He said, this you need to have when Simpson Rodino goes into place. How's that for the jerk of the year? And, and of course, we didn't get it done, and we passed a bill which had all the teeth removed it from it because we didn't have a more secure identifier. Now, look what's happening in Arizona, hurting employers. They're going for the hip now, which is where it always was, because the chamber said, we're not the policemen of the world. I said, you're not, but for God's sake, you gotta, got to know the person in front of you knowingly is, is able to hire. So the bill didn't work. Uh, nothing they are doing now will work because they're doing nothing. Uh, amnesty is a flash word. Uh, uh, it is absolutely, it's still the same game, emotion, fear, guilt, racism. Sad to watch, but let me tell you, I walked with my head high because that bill brought three million people out of the dark. Three million people came from 92 countries into the light under that bill, and I'm very proud of that. But let me tell you, when you use those flash words, national ID, and now what are they talking about? Retina scans and fingerprints. I haven't seen one editorial yet about the slippery slope. Disaster. I don't want to make those grimaces again. Those are bad. Anyway, 
any anything any yes um, you talked about the engagement of Vice President Biden, but to really get something done by August 2nd, don't you need the President to take a much more active role and be more of a leader in, in this budget stuff? I think if he did, he would, because he's an effective politician, be able to um, have, a, have a public behind him. He, he will come to that, but let me tell you, he wasn't going to do it before, because anything he would have done the raptors from the cliffs would have torn him to bits. And anything the Republicans would have done, the administration would have torn them to bits. Well, the saddest part Ryan. of yeah. what? They've done it to Ryan. Oh, oh, terrible. He invited Ryan to that, to that event. And he was in the front row with Erskine and I. I think if I'd been Ryan, I might have gotten up and left. He didn't use Ryan's name. He dumped it all on the Republicans. I think it was a mistake to... Ryan should have just put it in and said, this is my proposal. But when it got the tinge of a Republican proposal, there were guys who didn't want to vote for that. And they all jumped off the cliff, and that's fine. And now, of course, this race up in New York's got them all chilled, you know, spooky, you know. But I'll tell you, the president has, if, if Joe Biden comes out of there, and, and he's going to come with something, and the president doesn't embrace it, I think he's doomed. I think that shows that he really is, I guess it's like all the presidents I served, it was ready, aim, fire. And this gentleman is ready, aim, 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 and no trigger. And, and if, he, if he ignores Joe Biden, uh, Joe will have words to say that are richer than mine, as he, that's where we have our charming relationship. But uh, that will that will happen, and and if the, I mean, 64 senators have signed a letter saying tax reform and do something with the entitlements. Chambliss and Warner are talking with 20 guys on both sides of the aisle who are ready to go, and will. I'm, I do not despair, but uh, the president, you know, I don't. I get called a Republican toady covering the president's butt so he can destroy the Republican Party. That's not who I am. But I tell you, if a president of the United States asks me to do something, I'll do it as an American citizen. And this president is very, very astute, adroit. His campaign is in full flower. Axelrod's geared up. He's got a network all over the United States. and. Uh, We'll just see what happens. But he can't ignore this unless Biden and the group can't come up with anything, and then chaos will, will run in the land. Yes. Yes. Every word. We, we're linked at the hip. I don't think he went for the milk cow thing like I did, but, <laughs> but uh, he enjoyed it. Uh, but let me tell you, when he speaks as this being the most predictable, he knows. How do you think he did the balanced budget in 96? He did that by visiting with Trent Lott, Newt Gingrich, Dick Army. He said, you owe me one. That's how I got that done days and weeks in a room with Newt and Army to get the balanced budget in 96. Don't forget. And this guy, he's, he's a wizard. And, and he knows the figures, and nobody can put him in a box and uh, play sharpshooter with him. He's just a magnificent person, and he's as honest, as, as, as true as a die. Well, you're thinking, how the hell do we get him out of here? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, you had a question. Senator, uh, segue into the Republican politics for a second. Last night's the only sort of candidate we're seeing talk about America's lost decade is Hunter and the Now, Jeff, what do you think of Andrew's face last night? What do you think of the leadership skills of the big guy? Well, I, uh, I haven't known him, uh, first and I were down in some, uh, 
in, in Boston when, when I taught at Harvard. I could have got into Harvard if I'd picked the locks, but I was there <laughs> teaching. Uh, and so I, I know him. Uh, uh, I don't know, you know, I, I just think it, uh, I don't know, but uh, Newt was assistant leader when I was, but I think his day has passed, and, and for reasons known and unknown. Uh, I don't, uh, Huntsman is a very bright guy, uh, but he, he's done a terrible thing. He wrote a letter to Obama thanking him for appointing him to ambassador to China and telling him how much he enjoyed Hillary and admired her. So. That'll probably cremate him uh, to have done such a hideous thing like that, uh, which is often the case. Now, you had a question, but I, I don't, I didn't watch it. I don't have, I can't do it. Uh, uh, yeah. No, you, you, yeah, yeah. I know you, I know you're going to ask an evil question, but I, you did before. I just don't know, but knowing Congress as I do, there will be some creative exit, <laughs> some some special, unbelievable bit of ledger domain, which is hopefully will fool the American public, make them breathe easier as they all worship the god of re-election. And that's out there. It's even with the new guys. Why the hell would the new guys be raising a ton of money if they didn't have something in mind to do with it? And going to their people that they bitched about the whole time they ran. I'm going to go out there and change the, the, the platform. We're going to have this money influence in politics. We're going to be our own people. They're all out there raising bucks. They all got their. They all got where where we all get in this town. But they're hitting their people as if that was okay, and not to get into the other well. That didn't answer your question, but it was. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? I actually didn't hear it. <laughs>